is climbing upon the dashboard so that I might greet you face on as opposed to with a click in my neck to the back. My name is James Henry. Uh, on camera today, all six feet and four inches of Brian the Thumb Joubert, dressed today in a fairly obvious khaki and a very spanky new blue hat. Very nice, Brian. Right. Uh, like I say, you are on a live safari here in the northeast corner of South Africa, the iconic Kruger National Park, which is in turn part of the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park, three and a half million hectares of contiguous wildlife wonderland into Zimbabwe, east into Mozambique, and of course, the most famous bit here in the Kruger Park. We're on a collection of private reserves on the western fringes thereof, called the Sabi Sands, and our little patch is called Juma, and we also traverse a little patch to the west of us called Arathu. In total, 1,500 hectares or about 4,000 acres. Brian, there's some zebra over there. There, right behind us. And over there, a huge herd. Now, zebras are rather magnificent creatures, I think. And we saw one giving birth just the other day. Certainly one of the most profound experiences I've ever had in the wild. While we watch this, what we call kinship group, uh, which is a sort of small unit that might make up a herd, um, you are on a live safari, as I said. So please do talk to us, hashtag Safari Live, if you're tweeting. Questions at wildearth.tv if you happen to be on the email. Or on the YouTube chat, you can talk to us there. That works really well as well. And I'll just try and absorb a little bit of the peace of the late afternoon. This is what is so wonderful about this part of the world, is the incredible peace that we're able to kind of derive from just being. You can see in the far distance, there is an elephant. <laughs> Most wonderful thing to see. A little bit closer by, five buffalo bulls lying in a pea green soup of their own making and the zebra obviously having a drink quite probably the stallion of this kinship group or a young colt and there's the stallion the stallion's bringing up the rear that's the more natural position for him to be in and that's probably a young son of his who's just about to leave the herd the rest will be his wives and offspring and they're probably not drinking because they're a little nervous of us. So let's just see if they don't pluck up the courage to come and have some pea soup to cool down their bodies on this hot day. It is 38 degrees centigrade, 199 degrees Fahrenheit. And of course, that is very hot, I think, for what is supposed to be the beginning of autumn. Now, we're not only got zebra and buffalo and elephant here. We've got some nyala off to the far right hand side, which we'll just give you a quick view of. And what we won't give you a view of is the buffalo watching us from behind and also a giraffe bull. So it's all happening around here. Oh, there's also a kudu. Can you see the kudu in the background? Obviously you can, Brian. So all the animals, as Kirsten says, are here today. Kirsten is in the final control. She is in the director seat. Uh, the second director this afternoon is a returned recently from Johannesburg, Geraldine Cheesecake Kent. And she, in turn, is being ably assisted by Louise Pavid. Welcome back, Geraldine. Now. I think that that little, that very little zebra is probably too large to have been the one that was born just a few days ago. But that said, I haven't seen the little one again. So it might be, I think it's too big though. But I mean, I was astonished at the size of the thing that came out of that poor mother zebra. And you can see they're not being very nice to each other. Zebra are renowned for being unpleasant to each other and everything else. And indeed, that is one of the reasons that they have never been domesticated. Yeah, you can see the stallion here. He's much, much bigger. He's got a thick neck.
and they, they bite and they kick and they put their ears back and they can be truly unpleasant. All the ox peckers there. It's just the most wonderfully peaceful scene. You can hear some drongos going crack, 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 crack. The ox peckers going bzz, bzz, every so often when they pluck up the courage to kind of overcome the heat. And I've always loved the footfall of animal hooves on the hard ground. Clippity, cloppity. Dylan, you're in Iowa, and we're looking at those buffalo, of course, which are basically swimming in the water there, and you want to know if I've ever seen a zebra do the same thing. Dylan, I haven't. I've probably seen them up to their knees. They wouldn't lie down, I don't think, in the water. Well, I certainly haven't seen them lie down in the water, but it's quite possible that they'd go up to their knees and have a drink. Uh, it's an interesting one as to why they wouldn't go into the water, but very few animals do. I suspect it's got to do with the fact that a buffalo is, of course, much less vulnerable than a zebra. It's about twice the size, two and a bit times the size. It, is, uh, it really does terrify lions to try and take on a buffalo like that. So because they're quite scary, it's probably easier for them to get up and defend themselves should a predator come along. The same can't be said for a zebra which isn't as large and doesn't have nearly the same terrifying horns on the front of its head. And so I suspect they don't lie down in the water simply because of the extra danger that there would be to them. I wonder if that elephant in the deep background there isn't perhaps the elephant that has been spending more and more time around Inga's house, where Jamie and Eugene are now living. Um, <clears throat> elephants, when it does get dry, will start to concentrate around camps. They quickly learn how to get through, over, under, um, or beside fences, and even electric ones are pretty useless against an elephant that really wants to get into a camp. And of course, because the grass is a bit greener and there are pools and that sort of things. And Kirsten, you're gonna to have to go again with that, I'm afraid I missed it. And so the elephants are gonna spend a lot more time Debbie, something about Scottsville. I'm very confused by that, I'm afraid. I'm gonna to have to ask Kirsten to try. Oh, there we go. Right, okay, so you reckon, Debbie, that that's the elephant that visited Scott's vehicle the other day, gave it a bit of a shove, uh, put a bit of mud on Scott's hand. Um, oh, that's interesting, okay, you reckon he's got that hole in the ear. Yes, he did seem to have a bit of a hole in the ear there, so that's a good one. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, we'll be sure to keep our distance from him, I think. But I was just saying they're going to get closer to the camps because the camps do water lawns sometimes, and they also uh, will have a number of green trees within the camps and also some swimming pools, which the elephants will find quite delightful during the dry times. Here is Beefy the buffalo. Look at him morosely walking up towards us in the heat. Now, if ever you needed to feel the heat of this day, look at this buffalo and his morose wandering. He looks hot, lazy, and bothered. He looks like he could fall over at any second. That, of course, is not the case. He will move at an astonishing speed if required or if threatened. <laughs> I always find the look of a buffalo's face so interesting. You know, they, they look so different from each other. They're completely unlike impala, which are almost identical. I suppose zebra look a bit different, but a buffalo's face is completely distinct from the next buffalo's face. And so you can tell the individuals from each other easily. And this guy's got a very Roman nose.
So our plan this afternoon, well, I mean, our original plan was to head around and try and find the lions that we couldn't find this morning. And that will be the plan as we go forward towards the sort of late, latter parts of the afternoon when it cools down a bit, the sun starts to sink towards the western horizon. The moment those lions, wherever they are, will be very, very hot and lying under a bush. Not sure where they are. Jamie is going to tell you a little bit about the search for those lions. She too is on the hunt. And let's go and find out from her what's happening on the western fringes of Juma. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our portion of the Sunset Safari. Oh, and it really is, I'm sure James has touched upon it, it really is quite a baking hot sunset. I'm hoping that at some point when the sun does actually set, we'll be a little bit cooler. And there'll be a bit of relief from these baking temperatures. So far, all of the animals that I've seen have been hiding as deep into the shade as they can possibly climb. And I imagine that that is what the lions will be doing as well. So we're on the search for the Inkahuma pride. We heard them calling this morning. I heard them calling from sort of to the northeast of where we were, so around Buffelsuk Dam. We had tracks of at least two of them coming across in this direction. So I'm checking really thoroughly along these roads to make sure that they haven't decided to come across. But it was interesting because this morning when we were listening to them calling, I distinctly heard two sets. So when James said that he'd found tracks coming across to the west and I'd heard lions crawling in the east, I was very, very confused. And he checked really thoroughly around that area and I didn't see any sign of the ones left behind. The only thing I can guess is that the Inkahumas have split maybe, or at least some were moving ahead of others and that they've, some of them stayed on Buffel's Hook. Their tracks went from the dam where they were seen yesterday with James, went up, Engineer went north the channel, towards the, over. towards into Buffel's Hook, across our northernmost boundary, and then two sets of tracks came back. It is possible that they decided to split up for a while. They do do that every now and again, without any seeming explanation. Well, that's my plan for the afternoon, is to just check this area very carefully. I know that James walked around a great deal this morning, and I hope that he came away with less pepper tick bites than I did. I went walking to where that art park was, where, that James found yesterday on the Sunset Safari. I did a long walk around there, and I came away with about 50 pepper ticks on my legs. Pepper ticks are the tiny, tiny little, essentially baby ticks. It's the larval stage of a tick. They're so tiny you could be forgiven for um, confusing them with a freckle, which on me is very, very easy to do. And now everything itches. My legs itch, my toes itch. Everything is decidedly itchy. Hello, Impala. That's the other thing that's interesting about this, is that there are so many... Oh, what are you grunting about? Looking for your baby. There are so many very relaxed looking impala around. She's grunting away. Looking, she's probably been separated from her lamb. Oh look, that little one's getting his horns. Oh, he stopped behind a tree. Come on baby, we want to look at your little budding horn growth. Amazing, after just three and a half months and already those little horns coming through. Hard to believe those are the same stumbling creatures that we saw just a few months ago welcomed into the world. They, of course, as the wildebeest or Viam actually just said to me, they don't, they know only this as their world, this dry, dry season. They've got no experience of what a real rainy season or a real summer would actually have been like. Oof, this is not a day to stop for too long in the sun. I feel a little bit like I might melt into a puddle. My next step, since there are so many relaxed looking impala, it's not impossible, but that doesn't mean that the lions aren't here. As we know, animals or prey species, general game animals that might be on the lion's menu would decide 
if they've spotted lions to actually remain in the area and just rely on each other to keep an eye on the movements of the lions because it's better to see a lion than not. Now that is interesting. Now there's some, sorry, I'm actually looking at the buffalo at the back. There's a breeding herd of buffalo, but I say it's a breeding herd, there's four. Now that generally happens when they've been harassed by lions. I don't see any more than that. And they look like, it's not Duggar boys, looks like there's females in there. Let me just double check that, otherwise, you know, if it's four Duggar boys or four older males, that's to be fairly, that's fairly normal. But four buffalo of sort of females or sub-adults is definitely a slightly different thing. So when I say I'm looking to see if they're females, I'm looking at the size of the horns, the shape of the belly, the lack thereof of a penis sheath, and patches of hair on the horns. Not the clearest view, not the easiest view to get. But from what, there we go, that female might give us a slightly clearer view. Come on, girl. That looks very much like a female to me. That does change things. I wonder where they've come from. Yeah, her head's gonna appear. You can just see the tufts of hair amongst her horns. It's not nearly as well built up as a male's horns would be, especially around the base or the boss. Well, usually a buffalo herd is of a couple of hundred buffalo is very noisy. To see four like this, is almost inevitably that they've been harassed by lions. No, that changes the game a little bit. They've come down from the, well, they've come south from the north. I wonder if we didn't miss their tracks crossing from Sydney's Dam. Because that, to me, if you're a lion pride, Sydney's Dam is a good place to go and wait for buffalo to arrive because they have to. Okay, there's, it's not four, it's six of them. Let's just pop our noses in to the buffalo herd and just see that there's not more hiding in the bushes and that this is just the sort of the, the front runners. It doesn't look that way though. Looks like it's just this group. And when a buffalo group is separated like this by lions, it can be a good couple of hours to a day before they manage to relocate the rest of the herd. Hello guys, what happened to you, huh? Where's the rest of your family? Here we go, nice clear view. There's definitely no other buffalo in this group. So, a splinter group, most likely, from being chased by lions. Four females. No calves with them. We know from experience that the Inkahuma lionesses are practiced buffalo hunters. And I think it's time for us to investigate a little bit closer and see if we can't find any tracks, if not necessarily lions, in the possibility of running buffalo tracks. And those are fairly clear when they're on a road. But these buffalo could have been moving all day. In fact, probably would have been moving all day. So that doesn't necessarily mean the lions are right here. It also doesn't mean they aren't. Oh, now let's see if we can get over the stump without doing any damage. Bumpy, bumpy. Let's put it this way. I've never seen a buffalo split, a buffalo herd split into tiny groups like that without the interference of lions. 
I've almost always been able to follow them backwards and find lines that caused that. And of course, now with this mini Impala around, I can't help stopping to look and see if I can spot Nelson at the same time. I must say, there's been a huge influx of Impala. I'm racing past them though, I want to get up to Sydney's Dam. Right now, the next thing we're looking for in terms of tracking and figuring out where those buffalo have come from, and if there is a kill, is the birds will give it away. Ooh, look backwards, straight into the sun. It's um, <laughs> burning my pupils at the moment, or my retinas. They're really so bright. But yes, birds of prey, particularly tawny eagles and battaliers, with their fantastic eyesight, and then the vultures will start to wander onto the scene as well. Right, buffalo, where have you come from? James for Jamie. Hello. James, there's four female buffalo all on their own, so slowly mobile south on Zoe's Road at the junction with that two track that runs to quarantine. I'm just gonna see if I can figure out if maybe the Nkuhumas chased them last night. Okay, copy. We're good to the landing in that block and the three or four walks through there and a drive after we had some elephants in the middle of the block, so, you know, I don't know, maybe something has popped out. Copy that, thank you. Hmm, nervous zebra as well. I went into a little bit of a panic there, which is unusual for the zebra in this area. They're very comfortable with cars. It was in response to us, but there's sometimes, sometimes there's more of a reason as to why they are so nervous. So James said that he heard a kudu alarm calling in this block. He did three or four walks around here, but because it was full of elephants, he was struggling a little bit. Two stallions, they're also a bit nervous. Let's see. What's wrong, Zebra? Two stallions giving us, watching us very closely. A bit more relaxed now. It's not windy, they shouldn't be as nervous as they are. Last night was cloudy and windy, which is a perfect hunting conditions for predators. Particularly this time of year in the drought, animals starting to get weaker, lose condition a little bit, and of course forced to go to the water hole. And on the, I'm talking about animals losing condition, possibly with diseases, Darlene in New Hampshire. Darlene actually wants to know if an animal, if a predator senses that the prey animal is diseased in some way, will they avoid it? I'm trying to find a nice view. We've got some piggies here as well. Our little family of two females and two youngsters was originally six female, oh, six youngsters, but it's down to two. Oh no, sorry, I'm mistaken. I see at least three little ones. There's one of the adult females. I've had these youngsters come right up to the car before. Oof, all the animals are stealing the bits of shade. Oh, sorry, Darlene, yes, I was right in the middle of answering your question about diseases. I will say that um, from observation and from what I've read, animals seem to recognize rabbit, other yeah, rabbit animals, the, uh, which they are terrified of and tend to avoid. But beyond that, an animal with TB, for example, a buffalo or something similar, unlikely that hungry lions or hungry hyena will avoid eating them. It's, they're not really recorded to avoid them. I made a mistake. Sorry, pigs, I cast dishonor upon your parroting skills. Looks as though there's three piglets, not two, as I originally thought. I 
last tank? Mm, no. Four. Four piglets. I know that Tingana did get one of this group because we saw him eating it. And I'm fairly certain it's this group because they tend to move in relatively small areas. They've grown so much from when we first started seeing them a couple of weeks ago. Right. I think let's leave them for now, continue on our search for these lions. Our view isn't fantastic, and right now, I don't know about VM, but I am slowly melting in the sun. And while we continue on in our search for these lionesses that managed to evade us this morning, let's find out what Mr. Henry's up to. Hello. Back again. Whoops, daisies. Um, we went to look at uh, that elephant just to make sure it was Scott's. Uh, it was, in fact, Scott's elephant. It uh, took, uh, I wouldn't say dislike, it just probably wanted to have a bit of a play with us uh, because we knew what it was like. We didn't hang around. He came towards us and we said, OK, fellow, this is your home. We'll leave, which we did post haste. He has gone off into the bushes and will hopefully learn some manners at some stage. Now, oh, I've got so attached to so many wires. What we have here is a tree, obviously, two different kinds of trees, but this one is the interesting one to me because it's been broken off by elephants and it is trying valiantly to produce new leaves. Now, Brian, this is the tree of which we have spoken many times. Do you remember what tree that was, Brian? Mm, I'm not too sure. Oh, Brian. I'm sorry, Jim. No, oh, so sorry. disappointing. I'm sorry. The variable bush willow, Combretum collinum. There's an adult leaf, and there's a baby leaf. There you are, Brian. There are your Combretum oh, collinums. Mm. Right, what we're going to do is taste the difference between the two, and I think what you'll find is the young leaf is very bitter, and the old leaf is not. New leaf, saltyish. Mmm, quite sweet, quite hairy. Yeah, new there. <laughs> new leaf, full of tannin, disgusting. Mm -hmm. And that's, I don't know if you can see here, is, did, did you notice that, Brian? Mm. Did you notice the difference here? Yep. This one has got red in it. Now, we know that red is the color of tannin. That is why tea is the color it is, and also, well, it's why some of the very red wines have got lots of tannin in them, um, but you don't really want a red wine with too much tannin in it, I don't think. I'm not a wine connoisseur myself. Interesting. So, that's what will happen. The young leaves, of course, they want to protect as much as possible till they're old enough to produce some photosynthetic materials. But I just think it's incredible that a tree like this, which has been snapped off five or six times, is still managing to survive. And that's just how it is out here. And in the wake of a big drought like this, trees with, that are clever like this, able to withstand such damage, are going to survive much longer than others. Well done, Brian. That was a very difficult segment, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Heavily moving things. We've gone past the Gallego water hole, and there were two buffalo lurking there, but not doing much. Oh. Ah, now we have another, this is competing uh, on Twitter for the greatest Twitter handle in history. We've had a James Hendry's fan, now we have Hendry fan addict. Well, I think that's the... I mean, joint first, best Twitter handle in history, don't you think, Brian? To a degree. To a degree. Good. Now, Henry Van Eyck, you very concerned about the severe injury that I received at the cantharidin, which is the chemical exuded by a blister beetle, and it exuded it onto the back of my already insubstantial calf, of which I cannot really afford to lose further. And this is the state of things. Brian, can you see? There, there, look, look at my injury, Brian. I'm looking. Oh, I don't know. Horrible, horrifying, really painful. 
Anyway, it's now, thank you, Henry Fan Addict, it has just turned into a kind of itching, itching um, sore. But not too bad. I should be able to be okay. Luckily, I'm a selfless human being, and therefore I'm able to continue taking these drives despite the extreme discomfort that my severe injury is causing. Brian, you don't seem that impressed by my sacrifice. Not very. Mm. Thank you, Henry Fanatic. We're going to head towards quarantine clearings now and see if we can't find something there in the way, just maybe indicate a little bit further as to where the lines have gone. Hello, Neil Lake. You missed yesterday's drive, which of course, and the day before, I think, which of course is an almost unacceptable activity. Anyway, Neil, you want to know if anything interesting happened? Well, lots of bits and pieces. I suppose, you know, our overarching narratives are the stories of the lions and the leopards, and perhaps that half-tail elephant, half-trunk elephant. And we saw her the other day, at least yesterday, and she was grazing along quarantine clearings, and she seems to be doing fine. She picked up two other hangers-on uh, in her little herd, so they were doing fine. Then Karula was seen this morning uh, on the road, on the main road, playing with her two little cubs, which is very nice indeed. So she's fine, absolutely okay, and uh, cubs are doing swimmingly well. The Inkohuma Pride was making an enormous noise. They came from Buffelshook Dam sometime last night, shouted around here, and then disappeared and we couldn't find them again this morning and we think we had their tracks going across here and then down into the block over there and we couldn't find them in there. I walked that block flat and so I don't know if they're lying under a bush there. There was a tawny eagle and a battalier so I thought maybe they had a kill but I couldn't find anything in there. So Jamie and I are looking around here like that and so our overarching kind of, I, I suppose those would be our big stories at the moment, the lions and the leopards, uh, and the drought, I suppose, is another good one. Uh, nothing particularly interesting has happened drought-wise since yesterday, but we are told that the entire country is to receive rain as of Wednesday. Now, whether that will materialize or not, we're not sure. The weather forecast in this part of the world is uh, notoriously unreliable, but perhaps we will have a little bit of rain to help us through these dry times over the course of the week. Otherwise, Neil, I think that's a pretty good summary of what's happened. Now, jean and I came for a little run earlier today before the heat of the day set in, and we saw a whole lot of elephants around here. They took fright at us. Not sure why, they were at least 100 meters. I think it was probably jean calves. Andre has more substantial calves than mine, Brian. Much and larger. Mm, yes, as do, as do most birds. Now, somebody has just been past here and said there were elephants, so I'm going to turn off the car. And let's have a listen while we look at these impalas. Young males, about a year old, just finding their way in the world and enjoying the shade of the same species of tree that we've just eaten. Mm. And I've just noticed the impala starting to look a little bit, mm, just a little bit rough. See the hips starting to stick out? Now this is a lovely question from Debbie in Vancouver. Oh, there are the elephants, I can see them. We're gonna drive slowly towards the elephants while I answer Debbie's question. Debbie, you want to know if these impala could have come from the Kruger and will the antelope move? The thing with an impala, Debbie, and this is a crucial thing of an impala's kind of biology, is that it's not a migrating species. It can't move big distances. And that is why where there is water, they will survive well. Where there is no water, they will not survive well at all. And so I think you'll find that these impala, they may have been augmented slightly by animals coming in from the eastern side of, uh, or the western side of Kruger, to the eastern side of the Sabi Sands. But I think this is largely the herds that we've been seeing around here for the last, you know, well, I mean, always, that we always see around here. And they look a lot bigger, of course, because those little lambs are now of, of an age that they're moving with the herd and adding substantially to its number. 
here are some elephants. There's another elephant over there, just walking down, possibly towards the water. There we go. <laughs> and here, I think, is Mrs. Half Trunk. to know if perhaps it would be a good idea for us to warn other guides that they should stay away from that elephant bull. Uh, yes, I suppose that would be a good idea. I think Taxon and Aubrey actually know him pretty well, so I think they'll probably avoid him as a matter of course. Now, this is quite interesting. There are a lot of elephants here. The half-trunk female will be somewhere here. I think, but there, there's a big herd here. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There are at least 10 or 11 elephants around here, 13, 14. This is wonderful. We'll stop here for now. There's one just in front of us over here, a young one, who seems to be very happy with us in our presence. Got mud all over his belly, or her belly. And they are loving this variable bush willow tree. Sorry, Brian, that was my head in the way. And all over the reserve, these bush willows are taking a hammering. And they just put up more and more and more greenery for the elephants to eat. And I've never noticed this before. I've, I've never noticed this species as such an important source of forage. And I suspect that's because I've never experienced a drought like this in this area. Oh, there's a cow off to the right-hand side of us with a magnificent set of ivory. She's got really beautiful teeth, <laughs> tusks. And that's what a cow's ivory normally looks like. It's normally fairly straight and down towards the ground like that. Gee, but there are a lot of elephants around here. Mm. So everyone, you try and count them. I mean, you obviously can't see all the way around us, but I, mean, I think we're looking at about 25 elephants here. this guy coming through the bushes. I really enjoy younger animals sometimes just because they're that much more inquisitive. They don't feel the need to sort of obviously ignore you, which the adults do quite a lot of the time. Hyena is a wonderful example of that. Where the adults, although completely unafraid of us, uh, will just, I mean, they don't like being around us, but the youngsters, I think because they get bored, you know, I think they enjoy spending a bit of time looking at us and while they'll carry on eating, I think they enjoy a little bit of interaction. This is just fantastic. Just fantastic. You can smell them a bit too. They smell, I guess, it's probably the dung largely that we're smelling. Ah, here. Done the word. Done the word. That's okay. That's Taxon going past with his guests. I just, let's go. I just want to angle us slightly differently, Brian, so that we can see the extent of this herd. I'll just reverse slightly. So I think you'll find that this is probably a number of groups. Three there, four or five behind this bush over here. young cow. 
Hello, Pamela. A very, you're an astute watcher, obviously. You know that there is disease that elephants get in their trunks, which can cause them to become paralyzed and unusable. And Pamela, that disease is easy to remember because it's called floppy trunk syndrome. And it's exactly that. The, basically, the muscles and nerves in the trunk cease to function, and the animal is unable to use those muscles and nerves anymore, and obviously will then starve to death. I've actually never seen it. I've heard of it quite often, but I've never seen an elephant with what we call floppy trunk syndrome. And it's called floppy trunk because the, the muscles in that trunk are like a concertina, which means they can stretch quite a long way forward. And if it loses control of the muscles and the nerves, the trunk basically extends fully and will just flop on the ground. Two little ones coming across the clearings. Hello, Mr. Moustache, this time in Michigan, all the way from Iceland, Denmark, Michigan, Chicago. Fascinating life you must lead. And Mr. Moustache, you want to know if they maintain the use of those muscles in the trunk until the day they die. As far as I'm aware, those muscles don't weaken. I mean, I'm sure they probably be get, become slightly less strong. They probably don't, not quite as adept and agile as they were in the youth of the elephant. But no, I don't think they become useless as the elephant ages. I've certainly never seen an old elephant with an unusable trunk. Of course, that is because they would die very quickly without the use of that trunk. It would be almost impossible for them to eat without the use of that trunk. Should we back up a bit more, Brian? <laughs> Just reverse gently down the road here. Come on, Wendy. It's all right, my girl. She's eating a fern. Is she? No, she's not. She's eating a senna. I'm just going to, I'll tell you what, rather than irritate her, I'm going to just turn around. Oh, we appear to have lost James, but we are continuing on our search for these mysterious Ngoomas. The only thing I can suggest is that they are somewhere in that block that we, James and myself, have been circling repeatedly, and that we've just missed them somehow. The interesting thing about the Inkahumas and tracking them on foot at the moment is the fact that at times, they have, they've, well, they've actually got to the point, and we've discussed this at length, we kind of think it's because maybe Junior isn't with them, so they're starting to feel more relaxed because a young male is a very dangerous thing for a lion pride, particularly after the Birmingham boys started their takeover. But what we've noticed now is that they appear to be more and more relaxed with, a, with our presence on foot. What that does mean is that if you walk sort of 50 meter radius of them, I'm just checking a track here. Nope. It's the world's largest hyena that's, that's tricked me. Thinking it's a lion trap. Um, if you walk sort of 50 meters away from them, whereas before they would look up at you or sometimes stand up to look, get a better look or just lift their heads. Now, if they realize that you haven't seen them, if you're not looking straight towards them, they just prop their heads back down into the shape. Yeah, from uh, where are you going to be checking? It could well be that James this morning, while he was tracking, walked past them and they were just hidden behind a bush or behind a termite mound. Ooh. Bumpy road. I'm going to go one more circuit around that area and see what's happening. James will be, James's signal just dropped. He'll be up and running shortly is on Wendy, which be, has been giving us the occasional niggle since she came back from the auto doctor. 
maybe just feeling a little bit of reluctance to go back to work after her, her extended holiday. that somewhat skittish pair of zebra and then the four buffalo on their own and leading me to draw a conclusion whether correctly or incorrectly and Charles was wondering well maybe is, are the animals skittish because they heard the lions roaring last night and Charles I'm not entirely sure I, it may be less to do with the fact that they heard them roaring and more to do with the fact that they were actually hunting in that area James said that he heard kudu alarm calling I've seen four buffalo separate from their herd. That being said, and I was thinking about this before, that those four buffalo could have come from another property with another pride of lions hunting them. It just seems so unlikely that all of these coincidences are coming together in the same area that the lion tracks lead to. So Charles, when animals roar, when lions roar, it doesn't bother the general game species or the possible prey species of theirs too much because it, then they know exactly where those animals are. It's essentially a giveaway. And that's why if you watch something like an impala, when they see a lion or when they see a leopard, they'll stand and they'll bark and they'll alarm call, but they'll, they won't really run away. They'll stand and they look at it, depending on what distance that that animal is from them, if they've spotted it early enough. It's a completely different response when there's wild dogs, however. When there's wild dogs, Impala don't even stop. Nothing stops to alarm call. They just go. If they are the right size, they will just run away from it. They don't waste energy alarm calling because it's two t entirely different hunting methods. Lions are completely reliant upon a stealth and ambush technique. We've spoken about this before, the fact that if their body temperatures go up too much, and because they've got such a very poor, if, very poor cooling system, they can't chase for very long. The animals know that they can outrun them. It's just a matter of being the right distance away that they can't launch, launch an ambush attack and catch them by surprise. I'm going to do one more loop of this area. It wouldn't be the first time the Ngumas have managed to hide themselves away right in the middle of a block. I'm just going to grab some of my Luke sort of tepid, tepid temperatured bath water and have a few sips. Or some large gulps rather. It's the kind of day where no matter how much water you drink, you still manage to feel constantly thirsty. Now, where are these lions hiding? James has gone to the sort of the southwestern corner of quarantine, and I think his next route will probably be to check along Finns Road up to where we first started the show. So he'll check very thoroughly there. And at this point, I'm also looking very carefully in the tops of trees for any signs of bird activity. has been doing some background reading and it's an article I saw as well that didn't have a chance to open. I'm just having a look at the beautiful crested barbet there since it's rested so nicely in the tree. I'm gonna just show you, sorry Valeria, I'll be with you in one second. Look at how that bird is panting. Beak wide open. Also exceptionally hot this afternoon. Oop. Not too hot to go hunting though. That is a crested barbet. For those of you new to the show and building your budding bird lists, a crested barbet. We also get the black collared barbet. Although we haven't managed, I personally haven't managed to get one of those on camera yet. We only occasionally hear them calling. Hmm, dum, dum, dum. Let's go this way. 
if we can't find them somewhere here. Valeria, you were just asking about that article that Kruger published or that somebody published today about the possibility of Kruger management opening up new water holes in Kruger to provide the animals with water. Kruger does pump certain water holes and they always have. They've closed others. Uh, I, I can't confirm or deny, Valeria. I'm not entirely sure. I will tell you that having just come from Kruger, there's still quite a lot of water in certain rivers and towards the central Kruger, so Mapani, Shinguetsi area and north, there's a lot of groundwater still and a lot of greenery. I don't know. Um, I imagine they will. That in turn comes with its own implications because you then start to put serious pressure on the ecosystem of that area. The animals move between that side and or try to sort of hover around the water and as a result they graze and browse more in a more concentrated area around it and that of course being a nat non-naturally occurring waterhole can have knock-on effects. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, I'm saying those are the repercussions of it. So it's something that will be very carefully considered by the ecologists. We shall wait and see as to what they decide to do and what will be most interesting is where they decide to place those water holes. Because to me, it's going to be the lack of food that starts to weaken the animals far faster than a lack of water. There's still a bit of water flowing throughout the Kruger. James is, seems to be back up and running, and he is still with those elephants, so let's jump on the back of his vehicle. Now, I must just apologize there. What happened was that something on the camera started to play back something that was recorded a while back. And that's why you saw pictures of those two animals who shall not be named. But it wasn't live. It was a sort of playback. There were no rhino around where we are now. We were just sitting here watching these elephants. And so something happened on the camera, flashed that over, and then we cut power. So that's what happened there but we are still with this herd of elephants who are having a whale of a time here with this Combritum collinum bush. They are poof, only about 10, eight meters from us, very relaxed, having a good time eating away at this tree. And <laughs> this one that's gone right into the middle there. This leg up, it's climbed. <laughs> I would, I would never have said an elephant could have fitted into a hole like that. But such is the deliciousness of the variable bush willow. Isn't this wonderful? I think this is just great. What a wonderful way to spend an afternoon with these giant elephants. And there was some impala kind of resting just before you left us in the shade of that bush. And then when the elephant started destroying the western side of it they kind of moved off and found some shade somewhere else and i was saying i think that impala that we saw like there's some more coming just behind us so i think we're going to sit here that impala that we saw earlier i said it was starting to look a bit ribby i do think that they are starting to look a bit ribby a little bit rough Rachel, you're in Ohio, and you want to know what the biggest tree species that an elephant can push over is. I don't think it's so much species as it is actual um, sort of size of tree. I guess, um, if we look, Brian, if you just point over at this one here, I mean, much bigger than that, it's going to have to be an enormous bull. And um, something like a baobab is obviously not a challenge at all. It also depends on what the sort of um, thick, not the thickness, the density of the wood is. So a leadwood tree that size, an elephant wouldn't be able to push over. A marula tree that size, yes, definitely. A knobthorn, absolutely. Um, so probably round about that size, maybe a bit bigger. I think an ebony or jackalberry tree that size. 
they might just be able to push over. But I mean, remember, cows will push over trees, and they, this would largely have been done by herds. All of the trees that have been pushed over here would have been done by elephant herds. A bull could push over a tree like that, and would sometimes push a tree like that over. And I mean, there's a big marula tree over there. I'm, I'm pretty sure that was actually just ring barked. And that one there, sorry, Brian. That one there. And that was either pushed over or blown over by the wind, and I'm not sure which it was, but it is, it's, that's an enormous tree. Anyway, I just thought I'd show you that because I spotted it. I'm not sure that it was pushed over by an elephant, though. I think a lot of those trees that are do actually get a disease inside them from elephants debarking them will then blow over in the wind, and that'll get put down to elephant damage when it isn't actually. Just looking around what else is about here. I think let's just go around this little thicket here and see. of these clearings is full of elephants. It's just wonderful. And this, that's one plant, everyone, as we get it far away from it. I know I'm going on about this Combretum colinum thing, but that entire thicket there, that's one tree, that's one plant that's been pushed over and grown over and pushed over and eaten and pulled apart again and again until it is now, it looks like a forest, but it's only one tree. Same thing is happening here for this poor terminalia or silver cluster leaf tree. And this one's been pushed over to the extent that there's actually a termite mound growing over the top of it. Isn't that cool? I think that's really amazing. Angels Aegis, you say that the best, um, <laughs> the best nutrition for an elephant seems to be under the tree. Because they are pushing them around, yes, maybe, but Angels Aegis, that is only because they want to get at the grass. Now, you'll know, notice on a clearing like this that they'll probably be doing very little grass eating simply because there ain't no grass here anymore. There's just a bit of that greenery that you can see on the ground is to a large extent forbs or sort of herbaceous plants that are not grass that the elephants wouldn't normally eat. And so on this clearing, they're not going to be eating underneath the trees, they're going to be eating the whole tree. Look how many elephants there are here, it's wonderful. We'll just, just gonna go a little bit around this thicket. And they're all being so very confiding to us. They're all very happy to have us here, which is very kind of them. <laughs> Three of them in this very confined space. One a fairly large cow. I don't want to get in their way. Oh, let me just drive all the way around. Isn't that wonderful? Just a fantastic view there of four elephants packed into the space that two men would struggle to fit into. Just giving us acknowledgement and then moving on. And the little one there is trying to pick up a bit of grass, a bit of those forbs that are quite green. That was just very special. <laughs> That's so special when that happens. When they, they kind of walk past you, they acknowledge who you are, they acknowledge your presence, and then move on. As if to say, okay, we're all right with you. Let's hope this one does the same. <laughs> yes. 
Hi. It's young bull. It's interesting to me, there's a very subtle, subtle difference in the way they behave there. That's just fantastic. It's the most incredible experience to be that close to them. And there's a real, there's a subtle difference in the way they behave. The female, big cow there, I mean, she's not that big. She's probably about 25, 30. He's probably 18, pushing 20, maybe. When she walked past here, she looked at us and she kind of did that and she looked and then she opened her ears and then she walked on her path. He did the same thing. He came up, he lifted his head up towards us and then he kind of got a little nervous and he sidled off to the side and then walked off. She didn't have that reaction at all. Her reaction was much more confident. I'm an adult, I'm a, I'm a mother and therefore, you know, I'm telling you, I'm okay with you there. If I wasn't okay with you there, I'd shake my head and tell you to go away. The male was kind of, I'm big and strong, ooh, but I'm not, uh, I'm a bit nervous. I'm not quite comfortable in my skin yet. I'm not quite an adult. And I don't know if you would have picked it up, but it was a very subtle difference in the way that those two elephants behaved. Very cool. All right, let's wait for these youngsters to come, if they come. Mr. Moustache, you want to know the size of an elephant's heart. Mr. Moustache, I can't actually tell you how big it is because I've forgotten. If I'm not mistaken, it weighs about 19 kilograms, um, which would be about 44 pounds. And, and giraffes, which is the next largest, if I'm not mistaken, is not much smaller than that, about 17. I'm going to have to ask Jerry to see if she can't find that information. I've been told it probably four or five times, and I still can't bring myself to remember it. So sorry about that, Mr. Moustache. We will get back to you with that in a few seconds. <laughs> So a big bull up to 21 kilograms and a sort of small cow, 12 kilos. Thank you, Jerry, for that. And a giraffe, Jerry, if you don't mind. Look at all the dust coming up out from them feeding on the ground. They'll probably be throwing a bit on them. Ah, and a giraffe is 12 kg, so a little bit lighter, but much bigger proportionately because they've got to pump the blood to overcome gravity and much more than an elephant does. Thank you, Jerry. And Jerry has also informed us that the giraffe's heart is two feet long. That's quite a long heart, really. I don't think mine's that long. Look at the dust there. Isn't that beautiful? See what a nice picture this is. And you can't believe how relaxed they are around us now. Like I said, 10 years ago, you couldn't have had a sighting like this. But at the same time, you want to be careful. You don't want to be overconfident. You don't want to take this for granted. They've allowed us into their space. And so we want to remain, we want to remain with in their sort of trust. Let's head across to Jamie. She's got a small reptile to show you. I have to, I have to just show you something really cute. You were talking about the size of an elephant's heart. I don't want to disturb him too much. This is going to be just a quick, quick little show with my hand for scale. Look at how tiny. It's all right, little guy. It's okay. I'm not going to touch you. Don't worry. Look at how tiny this little baby leopard tortoise is. Compared, he's smaller than my palm. He is so, so cute. And actually quite comfortable with me next to him. He's not freaked out at all. He's about the length of my finger. How cute is that? He's managed to beat himself in some sticks there. <laughs> all right, little guy. Off you go, find yourself some shade. And some safety. Viam actually spotted him crossing through, crossing over the road. 
definitely the smallest leopard tortoise I've seen, probably about a year or two old, believe it or not. They grow very, very slowly. Right, I didn't want to take you away from James and his elephants for too long since they were having a dust bath. So let's jump back on the, his vehicle. Those are wily things, those leopard tortoises, you know, they're not easy to follow. I know, I've tried it myself. I was completely flummoxed by one the other day. It crossed the road, I asked for a crash cut, and by the time the cut came, they were gone. Anyway, we're still with the elephants. They're much easier to follow, not quite so fast, not quite so camouflaged. And you can just see them standing in a grove of silver cluster leaf trees, throwing up the dust, and I just think the color of it reflecting off the soon-to-be setting sun is something really tremendous. Isn't that lovely? You can't paint a script like that. I mean, that's just fantastic. Woodland kingfisher calling off to the west. Gentle breeze coming out of the southeast. Smell of the dust, smell of the elephant's subtle sort of sweet leathery smell is what they smell like. Hello, Noah. You say, can we just sit here all day? This is amazing, Noah. That's <laughs> precisely what I'm thinking. I'm thinking we should sit here the whole day as well. It's a cheetah planes car in the background, as you can see there. And luckily, the elephant, of course, blocking the faces of their guests who have not signed a release form. Here's a youngster trying to suckle over here. There you can see, see my finger technique there, Brian. And probably a little bit big, to be honest, and the mother doesn't seem to be particularly interested in allowing access to her mammary glands, although they're still quite swollen, so maybe she is still lactating a little bit. Now, oh, this chap's about two years old, and so he's, um, he's gonna have to shortly give up his thoughts of drinking milk ever again and move on to the delicious greenery of Cambritum calinum, the variable bush willow. Now, a whole lot of them seem to be coming across the clearing. We try and move into a position where you can see them all. Now we can count them probably. Everybody, please try and count the elephants for me. Is it right, Brian? I'm okay, thank you, James. <laughs> All right, I'm going to count them myself. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen or so, I think. That's not as many as I thought there were. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Hmm, about fifteen. Not quite as many as I had expected. Mm. Fantastic. Now, I want you to look at this landscape, everyone. There's quite an interesting human element to this and why this landscape looks to me, looks beautiful to you. In fact, well, before we do that, this is an interesting little exercise. Can you send through a mark out of 10, 10 being uh, magnificent, one being putrid, uh, as to what you feel about the beauty of the scene that you're looking at. I want you to ignore the elephant slightly, not, not the beauty, the comfort. I want you to evaluate the comfort that this scene gives you, and then we're going to chat about why it gives you that level of comfort, if it gives you any comfort at all. So, mark out of 10 for comfort, hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. And then, so 10 is very comfortable, one is lying on a bed of nails, uncomfortable. And what I want you to look at is just the an entire picture of the scene, the trees, the grass, the elephants, and the space. See what kind of a, a mark you would give a scene like this. And then I'll tell you what I would give it, and I'll tell you why I think you're gonna give the marks you do. Hmm. That's just wonderful. It's 
so peaceful and just grazing off. It's almost like I wonder if one of the big adult cows hasn't said, guys, let's move off towards different pastures. We've eaten this clearing free of anything that's going to be useful to us. Jamie Patterson has um, imbibed some of the competitive nature of her friend Brent Leo Smith. She says the viewers should rate this in comparison with the sighting that she had last night. Um, I wasn't aware that it was a competition, um, but as far as I understand it, she had a pretty spectacular sighting last night. <laughs> This is just so special. I'm sure Jamie's was very special too, but <laughs> I think this is very special myself. So, Rame, you're giving 9 out of 10 for comfort. Sandy and Shannon, you give it a 10. Brian, what do you give it? Out of a comfort level? Yes. I would say three. Three? Three. Why? Well, simply because of the lack of grass means it's at least can't okay. be that comfortable. All right, fine. Brian gives it a three. I give it an eight. Wendy, you give it an eight. Wendy, you give it an eight distinct from Wendy. Okay, I'll discuss why I think it makes people feel comfortable. I accept what Brian says, that it's not comfortable for the elephants. But as we look through there, what you can see is that you've got big trees and you've got open land underneath them. And there's something about that as this little elephant starts to suckle now. Mum's being quite patient. You can see the little one is a bit stressed. That's why that kind of temporal gland is starting to weep. We as human beings are tremendously attracted by this kind of landscape. It's why our parks are this kind of landscape with lawns and grass underneath with a couple of big trees, no thickets. Thickets make us uncomfortable and it stems back to our evolutionary past. Remember, if you were out on the savannas of East Africa, there's a tree going down there. And in our evolutionary past, if you were lurking about on the plains of East Africa, you don't want to be around a thicket because there could be anything there that could eat you. You want to be near trees so you can climb them to get out of the way of something else large that might get at you. And this is what we, it's what we call parkland. And it's something deep-seated within our human psyche that makes it feel comfortable, where we can seek safety within the trees and we can see if predators are coming to try and bite us. And, I mean, obviously it's irrelevant for our survival these days, but it's something deep in our psyche and that's why our parks look like this. You toss a few elephants like this, peaceful, peaceful elephants, in the middle of a parkland like this, and I just think that the feeling it gives me is one of tremendous comfort. Brian, not so much. And, and, out the box. And, and our beard, you said nine out of ten, a bit like an urban park, absolutely. So, yeah, just being a little bit more con confiding about the comfort. What is that? Sorry, I'm trying to get out of the way, everybody. I'm now leaning out of the car. painter. <laughs> if you want to know if, if the drought persists, will the elephant's mothers be more likely to let their babies nurse going into the drought because of dry and adverse conditions? No, definitely not. Oh, goodness gracious me, there goes a tree. Did you hear that, everybody? <laughs> Tin painter, a female animal can only make milk for as long as she's physiologically able. 
Now that means that um, once weaning age has been reached, weaning age has been reached, and in a drought, she will also be nutritionally compromised, which means it'll be very difficult for her to make milk, even with a, you know, a, a calf that is within weaning age. So no, I don't think there will be extra um, milk produced during a drought at all. I think it'd be quite the opposite. This is quite a tender scene here, I must say. Mm. This is just amazing. Elephants absolutely everywhere. Two little ones coming up here. And those two are now probably only about 10 meters from us. And they're just, they're the first two little ones we saw. And they're the ones that I spoke about when I said, I think elephants get a bit bored and they like to interact with us a bit. I think that's what's going on here. I think the mother of the the mother of those two is coming past now, just telling them to hurry along. Don't bother the people anymore. Oh, this is incredible. She's so close to us now. I'm just going to be very quiet. This is unbelievable. She's only about two meters from us. Just incredible. I'm getting covered in dust. Brian, are you getting covered in dust? <laughs> this is unbelievable. She's only two meters from us. She looks to be pretty comfortable. She's not kind of flapping her ears in anger, just cooling off. Look at her making dust for herself. This is unbelievable. I'm covered in dust, everyone. She has absolutely covered me in dust. Completely covered me in dust. <laughs> it's in my eyes, it's in my nose, it's in my ears. talking to each other. I don't know if you can hear them talking to each other. Oh. This is just, this is, that's. <laughs> that was too, <laughs> I can't bring myself to try and describe that. <laughs> Gee whiz. Here comes another little one. <laughs> that was just awesome. She showed no sign of irritation at all. She's talking to this cow here, who's heavily pregnant. You can see she's got a very big bulge. Unless, mm, unless this is her youngster. I can't believe it would be, though. This little one coming out. Tiny little thing. Trying to pick things off with its trunk, which is almost completely useless at this stage. That's a little one only about mm, maybe 16 months old. Look, you see how it tried to pretend to eat there? He tried to pick a few leaves off the trees there and couldn't, because the trunk doesn't work properly. Also doesn't know what to select. I've never seen any of the other elephants eat that particular plant that it tried to pick. Yes, you 
so witches. The youngsters will take their lead from the females, of course. <laughs> this one is slightly older. Michael, you're 13 years old, and you want to know if elephants sneeze after all of this dust. Michael, that elephant in front of us there just sneezed right now. <laughs> Was that not the most unbelievably surreal experience there. He just did it again. Did you see that? The sneeze was basically uh, shone up in the setting sun there. <coughs> now, Brian, of course, has the same problem as that elephant. He gets terrible hay fever from the dust. So when an elephant has been tossing dust at him all the time, well, he's going to sneeze. You are right, Brian? I'm all right. Thank you. Brian, how does that make you feel? Um, the best ever? Mm, a sense of awe at the suddenness <laughs> of what the nature provides. Please ignore Brian. <laughs> I'll explain where that comes from once this wonderful elephant sighting is finally drawn to a close. I'm talking nonsense about this one, Brian. Look, she's not pregnant. I, I, this youngster is now suckling from her, and we think that elephants don't... Well, they can cross-suckle, you know. That's interesting. I mean, she's got a definite bulge on the side of her belly there, and yet that little one is suckling from her. And I wonder if she hasn't just perhaps started to lactate already. I don't know. Oh, there's another one coming. Two more youngsters coming this side. is just the best. Just the best. <laughs> so I wonder maybe is a little bull you can see and I wonder maybe if yeah like I say she isn't about to give birth she started lactating and mm, this relationship just looks too close to me though. Maybe they remain swollen for, but, uh, for a while, but I mean, that thing is, is over a year old. We know that because you can see that it couldn't fit underneath. He couldn't fit underneath his mum's belly, and until they're a year old, they can fit underneath their mother's bellies. I just can't believe how lucky we were there. I'm, I'm absolutely astonished. My heart rate is, I wouldn't say it's pounding, but it's, it's definitely, it's not elevated so much as really strong. I feel it's such a connection. It is very hot today. It is sitting at roughly 38 degrees, or it certainly was sitting at 38 degrees Celsius, 99 Fahrenheit. And Indiana Jane, a valid question, do elephants sweat? The answer is no, they don't. They don't have waterproof skin, though, which means not that it's sort of porous like a piece of gauze, but it does mean that they can evapotranspirate. In other words, um, that's a really appalling way of using the term plants evapotranspirate. It means that they can use evaporation for cooling, but without sweat glands. So we've got glands that sweat, and an elephant can lose bodily fluids through its skin, but without the use of sweat glands. So they do, I mean, I suppose they sweat slightly, but they don't have sweat glands, as far as I remember it. Look at this little thing here, come up to say hello now. Taking the example of its mum. This one is quite young and 
is now two meters from the car. <laughs> and I must say, it's not quite as terrifying when an elephant this size is this close to the car. Well, it's never terrifying, but it's, it's not quite as awe-inspiring, but it is just as wonderful. How cool is that? This is just unbelievable. Hi. <laughs> Look at the little bit of white in the middle of its eye, you can see. It's so close. This is the most fantastic elephant sighting. <laughs> I'm just going to sit here for a little while and absorb what I've just witnessed. Let's go across to Jamie for a little while. She's got a donkey. Shane. <laughs> It does look a little bit like a donkey. I'm going to speak nice and softly so that we don't give this tiny baby little water buck a fright. We've seen them a few times on their own recently. It's fairly typical for mom to leave them hiding away in the bushes and to go off feeding. And because we're perfectly downwind of it, it knows that we're here, but not quite sure what to make of it. Really often with little animals, they don't show the same level of fear unless they've learnt it from their parents. Look how tiny that little thing is, hiding away in the bushes. Perfect place for it to be. How cute is that? Just a little waterback watching us. I'm keeping my movements nice and slow. It doesn't seem to be all. Little footstep there. Doesn't seem to be terribly scared at all. All right, little one. Where's mommy, huh? He is out flicking backwards and forwards. Already that instinct to stay alert has kicked in very strongly. Obviously, doesn't view us as a threat. Much, much lighter in color than the adults as you'll see with most of the large antelope species. So for example, sable and roan, waterbuck, oryx, their calves all take on a slightly, and wildebeest actually, their calves all take on a very small, oh, a very much lighter color. And that they blend in more with their surroundings. But little one, you shouldn't really be standing right out in the open like this. It doesn't need, oh, however, James's elephants are up to more shenanigans. Let's find out what they're doing now. We've just watched um, an attempted mating, I th think. Brian is... I'm just... No, we didn't. We watched a attempted dominance display. Two bulls. That thing with the long tusks there is not a cow, very clearly. That's interesting. I thought she was a cow. Just from those long tusks that point towards the ground, that just shows you. And I didn't look for any other signs. She's obviously not a cow, but I mean, you can see that now. But doesn't have swollen mammary glands at all. So young bull, and with another young bull there. And now, we had a question about whether they like to butt heads or not every so often to fight with each other. Well, there you go. They do butt heads. That explains that behavior so perfectly. You know, I thought to myself, this is so odd for a cow to be doing this. Unless. The second one that came up was definitely a cow. She had those large mammary glands. Here we go, a little tussle between the young bulls, sorting out who's who. 
Now, this is what the matriarch will not tolerate for a while. Once they start doing this sort of thing, they're getting to the age where they need to move out and go and find a, a digs on their own. See how the little, the one with the smaller tusks tries to get above the one with the long tusks' tusks? <laughs> this is a real clash of the mini titans going on here. This is brilliant. And just a little snack to refresh themselves in between, as Kirsten has pointed out to me. So that's totally normal. It's exactly, exactly the same as young human men, sort of just about 18 or 19, trying to feel each other out, check who's the dominant, check who's tougher. It's the same thing, exactly. Except the difference here is that if you back down physically, you're nowhere. You can't make your brain count as an elephant. Whereas a human being, mercifully, for those of us who are five foot eight, you can. Move just a little bit closer so we can see them both. <laughs> Hello, Gracie. Welcome. Welcome to you and Safari James. You say you wish you were sitting on the seat here with me and um, Circus Brian. For those of you who didn't know, Brian was in the circus at one stage of his existence. A very, very life has our Brian led. And Gracie, you say that it was a magical moment. It was certainly. And I hope one day, Gracie, that you will indeed be able to come out here and experience it firsthand as we are now. And we're now right back smack bang in the middle of the herd again. Now, I'm actually going to forgive myself for that misidentification. There are two elephants here with this very similar tusks. There's the cow you're looking at now. That was the original cow that I said is a cow. She is a cow. And then there's that bull in the middle of the thicket over there. That's me circling his bottom. Um, that's him there, and he's got very similar shaped tusks to this cow to the left of us. It's still pretty warm out here, I must say. We are, we are sweating and sweating in the sun, aren't we, Brian? Mm, mm. I would pull you into the shade, but unfortunately, we're quite close to the elephants. Mm. Neil Lake, a nice question. Why we sit here watching all the animals eating and wondering why there are no adult bulls here. Neil, you want to know if they are matriarchal or patriarchal? They are unquestionably the former. They are, live in a matriarchal society, very well documented, very well studied matriarchal society, led by the oldest and most experienced female, not necessarily the biggest. Each herd will have its own matriarch, and the bulls, once they reach this sort of rambunctious age that the ones you've been watching have reached, uh, they will be thrown out by the matriarch, and they'll have to go off and live on their own. And initially, they'll live in a small bachelor group. They might find a very old bull to kind of teach them the ropes, and then they'll go off on their own. And the rest of the herd, which will consist of related females and their youngsters, will be led by the oldest female. And I think it's interesting that they don't breed, as far as I know, until the day they die, unlike most animals out here, which means that the older animals have got an important role to play in teaching the younger generations. So, where in most species, lions, leopards, impala, the old females will die. I mean, an old female is a female that cannot give birth anymore. There's no kind of stage of menopause and a stage at which they live without being at breeding age or beyond breeding age. Whereas in the elephants, that is not the case. Very much like human beings, where the older animals have got a role to play. <laughs> have got a role to play in teaching. getting 
very cross with each other. For one of the little tusks especially, he's got short tusk syndrome, clearly. This is fantastic. This is awesome. Look at them framed by that tree. he thinks he's going to do to that. Be quite something if we can push that over. My theory will be completely, <laughs> completely blown out of the water. How awesome is that shot? I don't know if you can hear them. Every so often they're rumbling. There's deep infrasonic rumbles that they make, but I don't think that you're going to hear them. Look at them. <laughs> about showing off and pushing the tree over. You see, it would be an immense show of strength for that elephant to push the tree clean over, but that's much too big for a little ball like that. There they go again. Look at the dust. This is just too brilliant for words. I just don't want to frighten them, the ones that are close by. I'm making too much noise. Well, maybe we can go around the other side there and watch those two bulls. I'm loath to drive through the middle of the herd just because I think it might unsettle them slightly. Ach, they're so relaxed now. Maybe we can do it. Remain in San Diego while we try and ease our way gently through this herd. You want to know if we're going to get more and more elephants from the Kruger, A, and B, will they show or demonstrate poor behavior or bad behavior? Rame, I don't believe that they're going to show any bad behavior. I do think that we're going to get more here, simply because there is water in the Sabi Sands where there isn't in many parts of the Kruger Park. And so, yes, I think the water that there is provided for the animals in the Sabi Sands will attract more elephants. I don't necessarily think that there's going to be too much um, of sort of poor behavior, if you like. But I guess the petition for food starts to hot up, maybe. Let's go and watch these. The herd is, pe the herd is pe very peacefully feeding down through the clearing. Let's go and watch these two young fellows have at each other. to be very wary of what's going on here. These guys start really having go at each other. They, the elephants can often lose their tempers with other small animals and start to chase them around. So there are a couple of impala around here who will be watching quite carefully to see what happens. I think that that bull with the long tusks has been vanquished. I think he's nervous. I think the little tusked one has overcome him which is interesting. Yes, there we go. This young bull is now chasing an impala. Here we go. Sorry, Anne, you're in Barbados. That sounds like a wonderful place to live, I must say. 
and you want to know how long the matriarch will tolerate these two young bulls within the herd as long as they fight like this. Not long at all. She won't put up with it, and I think you'll find that's probably... I, oh, look at that. Isn't that amazing? It wouldn't surprise me if she told them to push off now. Oh, this is getting quite serious. There's no question who's the dominant here, though. You can hear the tusks crashing each into each other, the dust exploding off the ground. So cool. Yeah, the long tusked one is, uh, is now a little nervous. He's been bashed. There are some impala getting out of the way and behind them there. pushing a tree. How's that? And having a snack. Round three is over. Look at the light, how it's changed, how it's gone gold. The sun is slowly starting to sink. And uh, now this youngster is saying to his mate, let's call one long tusk and one short tusk and it'll be easier. Or let's just call one long and one short. Short is pushing on the tree in order to say to long, watch out buddy, I'm coming for you. Yeah, and there we go. Impala scattering to the right-hand side. <laughs> they just slowly e leak down the road here. Here comes Long. He's coming out of the bush. There's a buffalo behind them even. You may have noticed. to be heading back towards mummy. He wants to have a bit of comfort from the herd. Whereas Short has now decided that he is king. He's going to feed on a bit of acacia exuvialis. He feels he deserves some delicious exuvialis thorns. And there's a little squirrel you may have seen just popping up the tree there. Brian in Philadelphia, you noticed an interesting thing. You noticed that both bulls became what you describe as aroused during the course of that um, interaction. And is that normal behavior, you say, and is it normal? Yes, it is. It happens with many animals out here. They get, um, I think, that sort of flush of testosterone through the body creates that, well, I suppose you'd call it arousal. I'm not sure that that's the correct term. I'm not sure what the correct term is. But yes, I think it's totally normal. Buffalo do it, absolutely when they fight. I've seen it often with buffalo. I'm not sure about any of the other animals because normally it's not quite as obvious as it is with an elephant, but it is entirely normal and often. I mean, we noticed it when this short here was trying to mount long, and that is also quite often very normal, where two animals will try and dominate each other and the dominant one will try and mount the subdominant one. I've seen it with giraffe as well. 
So, Brian, in Philadelphia, yes, uh, we're not really a sensitive subject. It was brutally obvious, wasn't it? But it absolutely is completely normal and happens in, uh, with a number of species. Look, 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 he's injured. You see on the edge of his edge of his nose there. So Viv, you want to know if they could break a tusk fighting? Yes. Absolutely, I think they could break a tusk fighting. Um, I think they'd have to fight quite a lot though, and I think it would have to be a really nasty smack to the tusk. But he's taken a tusk to the nose there. He's now smelling some dung and just watching us. It's all right, fella. You smell him, Brian. Mm. He's got kind of a different smell about him, doesn't he? I'm sure that's got to do... It's almost like a, a weak must yeah. smell. And I'm sure that's got to do with the amount of testosterone now coursing through his body. He may be coming into his first must, of course, which would make him smell like that. Must, for those of you who don't know, is an elephant's sort of time of mating. The enormous amounts of testosterone start coursing through their bodies, and that smell that you can smell uh, drips from the penis sheath, and it's called green penis syndrome, actually, GPS. Uh, it's a green and smelly substance that in a big bull will lose them, apparently, more than 50 litres. That's 10 gallons of water a day. And still the rest of the herd is just kind of, I don't know, being, feeding across this clearing, browsing, doing a bit of grazing, and I think they're going to melt off down into the woodland here. They may decide to turn around and go and have a drink at some stage. Oh, dear. Short is coming up to his mate again. Won't leave him alone. this. Oh, that's typical. See that? That's a greeting. He put his tongue, not his tongue, his trunk. He put his trunk into Long's mouth, and that's a very typical way of saying hello with elephants. That's what they do. So maybe the conflict is over. Oh, I'm sorry about the sun glare, everybody, but I can't get both of them in picture, I don't think, unless I... Oh, maybe I can sneak forward. Shall I try, Brian? Mm. I thought that was quite an artistic of me to stop there, Brian. I also did. You know, Kirsten disagreed yeah. profoundly. Oh, well. No, some well. people are artists and some aren't, you know, Brian? Yeah, not everyone's art is appreciated. No, that's also true. for this picture, everyone. Well done, Jim. Thank you. And there, now we had a comment earlier, and I forget from whom, about the fact that they think that nutrition underneath the plants is that much better, and it absolutely is. You can see there that plant there, the dead knob thorn, has been housing some grass that has been protected from all other grazers except an elephant. No impala could be able to get in there and get that grass that's been growing safely underneath the knob thorn. So the elephant has simply pushed that knob thorn tree away and is now supping on the delicious green grass there. And I tell you, you can almost feel the relief and the uh, enjoyment that they must get from eating green stuff like that when you look around and see how much brown there is. Bob, you're absolutely correct. 
you say, could we get misplaced aggression if we are close to battling elephants? Yes, definitely we could. Not young bulls like this. Young bulls like this don't worry me. If these were two titanic larger bulls, six tons each, say 30 years plus, I wouldn't be anywhere near this close to them. They would absolutely react to a vehicle this close to them. But these youngsters are just kind of messing around. But Bob, yes, completely. You would definitely tell that if there was two 14, 30, 40 year old elephants with big tusks like that big thing that um, had Scott, Scott's mate, the big thing the other day, if he and another similar sized elephant were having a fight near us, no, we wouldn't be anywhere near them. So they're going to melt off into the woodland there. We'll just get one last look at the rest of the herd up here. And then I think we might try and head to the hyena den. What say you, Brian? Mm, sounds like a great idea. Yes. Unless Jamie's there. If Jamie's there or wants to go there, then she can, of course. There they are. They're, they're having at it again. You can just see there. If, if Jamie's close by to the hyenas and she wants to go, then let's let her go. Otherwise, I will go in the next sort of five minutes or so. I'm obviously relaying this to Jamie via Kirsten. That's why it sounds like it does, really. <laughs> it sounded so weird, I thought I'd better, I better just explain it. <clears throat> Now this is the block where I thought the lions were, but I don't think that this is where they are now. But we'll listen up, we'll come back past here as night falls. Right, we're gonna leave this absolutely brilliant, spectacular, awesome herd of elephants to head off into the sunset. And we're gonna go off towards the hyena den. And as we do that, let's head back across to Jamie. Wasn't that just spectacular? Sounds like James has had the most incredible time with that very special elephant herd. In the meantime, still no luck with the Nkumas. I don't know where they've gone. At this point, anybody's guess is as good as mine. But I have found some really beautiful Inyala in the stunning late afternoon light. A nice contrast between the female that we were looking at and now with this magnificent bull. Having a quick scratch. This morning, we were lucky enough to see two male Anyala doing their slow dance, where they sort of, all the fur along the top of their backs and underneath their tail stands up on end, making them look very big, and very fluffy and very pretty, in my opinion. And then they do that really, really slow walk, presenting another male with a side view of their bodies, making themselves look big and puffy. And doing a bit of an Inyala dance as a way of intimidating rivals. In this case, though, this bull has got nothing to worry about. Oh, actually, there is another male to the right of him. So he is around. There is competition. Though I think the gentleman... Oh, where did you come from, little male? You can just see he's taken on, starting to take on the coloration of an adult bull. But still a little bit lighter, like the female. And the horn's just starting to come through. So he hasn't fully reached his mature physical appearance, like a mixture between the male and the female. Let's see. Oh, there we go. There's one last straggler. That's a male, too, believe it or not. A much younger male. Look, there's just the budding start of his horns beginning to grow. Look at that cool double stripe on his shoulder as well. So those horns are bones growing up from growth plates. Imagine if we had to grow completely new, a completely new set of bones. I know, of course, that as we grow up from children to adults, our bones lengthen, 
and solidify at the growth points at the, at the tops of them or at the ends of them, we don't really grow brand new sets of bones in the same way that male antelope do. Shame, look, he's panting as well. He's also very hot. And with time, his fur will start to darken. One last straggling female. And since all the animals are panting, including myself included, the safari dean was wondering, is there, is there any other, is the, sorry, let's try that, start that entire sentence again. Is there any other animal, or is there any animal that enjoys extreme heat? And Safari Dean, now that I've managed to get that question out, I'm just trying to think. There are certain types of bacteria which are called thermophilic bacteria. Thermophilic bacteria quite enjoy heat. That, that I suppose, is an animal if we're going to go down that route. And, um, beyond that, I can't think. There's no specific, certainly no mammal out in this particular area that really enjoys the heated temperatures. All of them are adapted to cope with it in some way or another. So from the elephant with their big flapping ears to animals moving in the shades to the, the theory that zebra stripes have a thermoregulation ability, the theory that uh, giraffe spots might work in the same way. Everything has an adaptation to be able to deal with it. Not all, some more efficient than others. For a little bit, I'll just make sure we can duck under this branch. Let's see if we can capture these Niala in the last few rays of the sun. Here we go. Lovely little mixed herd here. paying a little bit of attention to the female. She looks pregnant to me. Not massively slow, so, but definitely a more rounded belly than some of the others. High up on the list of some of the most attractive antelope. In fact, I think in terms of different antelope tribes, the spiral horned antelope family, you know, the bushbuck, the nyala, and the kudu, Definitely win the most attractive family award, the most attractive antelope tribe. There you can see those color difference beautifully and how much more white there is on the top of that male. Very, very striking antelope. Something that I always think about when I look at the Inyala was that folklore story that Teresa told me about the idea behind, the explanation behind the white on Kudu and Inyala. And essentially the idea behind it was that their spindly legs were too thin for them to be able to stand up in the beginning. So their creator reached down and helped them up. And the white stripes and the white dots and the patterns on their face is in theory where the creator touched them in picking them up. And I don't know why, but that particular story I found incredibly touching. Because when you look at them, it does sort of, they're places that do look like fingerprints on them. A couple of spots on Inyala. Inyala have stripes and spots. You could do in terms of telling the difference. Kudu, in terms of telling the difference, Kudu mainly have stripes, which brings me back to a question that I got asked yesterday about whether or not Kudu always have nine stripes. And now Rocky Knight was wondering about Nyala, whether or not they always have nine stripes. So now I feel obliged to have a quick count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. No, Rocky Knight, they do not ever have just nine stripes. Every Inyala has a different stripe pattern. Some have definitely got more than others. This female, for example, I think probably has at least 11 or 12. Running down her, oh, that male's. Come on. Is it gone flat? No, it's soft. It's very really soft. Fall into your shirt. No, it's still here. Oh. Will these just 
checking sound quality. Oops. Let me just see what this male is doing. It looked like he was thrashing a bush. Oh, he stopped now, he's going to walk behind. I think our best position is going to be to stay here. But yes, each individual in Yala identified by different stripe patterns if you wanted to go down that route. We had a couple of them living in the camp where I used to live before I started at Wild Earth. And Nyala are very common garden antelope species. They like, they habituate very quickly. And they like to come wandering through next to camps because the lawns almost inevitably get watered. We used to get herds of up to 18, 19 in Yala wandering across the lawn. And we got to know certain individuals over time. There was one called Lady J, had a backwards J stripe on her shoulder. And we watched her raise a successful number of lambs over the years. woodland inhabitants. You can see why they're part of the spiral horn family, even in this young male. The horn's starting to develop that twist. I think he heard something. I'm just making sure that it's nothing scary. Again, like with kudu and giraffe as well, Nala don't have any kind of set herd structure. He's got a, is that a nick? No, it's not a nick out of his ear. They don't have any kind of set herd structure, so this male will be allowed to stay with these females, even, if, even though he has reached sexual maturity, and it's only really when a female comes into estrus that he might be driven away by an older bull. And I told the story this morning about the two males that were fighting physically in the garden, which you don't often get to see. It's not often you get to see Nyala physically come to blows. But they were fighting over a female that was clearly ready to mate. And while they were distracted, a male of about this size managed to sneak in around the corner and ended up being the male that got to mate with her. And we were all applauding him because it was such a fine example of brain before brawn. managed to be highly successful. If I go forward a little bit, oh no, he's just moved into some thick. Kudu. No, Kudu, barking. No, it's coming to you now. Oh, cool, awesome. That would actually be lovely if he would decide to come through into the sighting and join us. That's what keeps attracting. You can see that female's head's shot up. That's what she's looking at. And she's going to keep a close eye on him, or her, until she works out that it's a kudu and not a threat. But really nice to have two members of the same family in the same sighting. Hopefully she keeps coming. And we can get a comparison of size. Now, looking at the Nyala, Safari Deans asked an interesting comparison question. And that is, after that wonderful elephant sighting with the incredible Mr. Hendry, he was wondering, if elephants get six sets of teeth, how many do other animals get? And the answer is, other animals get two in their lifetime. They're milk teeth, and then, and sorry, I'm talking mammal species, not something like a crocodile or a shark that continues, continuously replaces teeth throughout its life. Now, the reason that elephants are so specialized in that respect is the amount of feeding that they have to do for an animal that size. There's the kudu coming through. So as ruminants, ruminants in general have to consume less food than an animal with a different digestive system because they digestive system is so much more effective. Oh, brilliant. Keep coming, Kudu. You're going to get straight up to the Inyala and we'll have a beautiful size comparison. Here you go. 
awesome. Double the size, if not more so in terms of height. Not often that we get to see that. So Nyala, much, much smaller. Fortunately, she just took a slightly wrong trajectory there and went further into the block. So Safari Dean, elephants as hindgut fermenters, that means that their digestive system is fairly inefficient. Now they excrete at least a third of what they eat, whereas with ruminants they digest far less. So if we take two animals of about equal size, a zebra, with a, which is a hindgut fermenter, and a wildebeest, which is not, they have to eat about, a wildebeest has to eat about half of what a zebra has to eat in order to get the same level of nutrients and to maintain the same body size. Now you increase that to two, three, four, five, six tons of animal, it needs to chew constantly and eat constantly in order to maintain it. And that's why elephants have evolved to replace those sets of teeth. Other animals just have their milk sets of teeth and then they have their adult teeth after that. And then, as I said, crocodiles, very, very different example. But if we compare it to something like a hippo, Hippos rely less on their teeth and more on their lips to draw food into their mouths. So they, even though they have a similar, if not exactly the same, but a similar digestive system to an elephant, they don't have to, they don't spend as much time chewing the grass as they do ripping it up with their lips. A little bit different. Nyala have moved on, I think so should we. I'm heading across to check on Buffles Hook Dam. And while I do that, Mr. Henry has made his way to one of our favorite spots on this reserve. So let's find out what's happening on the hyena then. Well, she's not the only one whose favorite spot this is on the reserve. Unfortunately, our favorite spot, Jamie's and mine, is occupied only by one hyena at this stage, a lactating female and scriptish ears, which makes me think it might be Madam, but she doesn't look big enough and she's got too much hair, so I don't think it's Madam. Anybody, any ideas who this is? I'm looking at her with my powerful binoculars, but I can't see. Now, the lack of activity here to me is interesting. I don't believe that they're gonna be in this den for long due to its slightly less than salubrious neighborhood. No shade, obviously. I actually think that is a factor. There's no shade around here at all. And I, it's on a major game path. If you go straight up that kind of um, path through there, you'll eventually hit Sydney's Dam, which is not too far from here. And I think that they'll find that this is a rather disturbed area. And so I don't know how long they're gonna be here. And I just, I don't know who that female is and I'm, postulating in my mind, and I, this because probably I'm 90% sure this is wrong, but this could well become a satellite den. Um, I don't think, I mean, I think it's normally a satellite den, but it might become a satellite den quite quickly, in which a female who hasn't got babies would come and, there's one, there's another one, in which a female who doesn't have babies might come and give birth. Who is this? Been lying in the mud all day. Looks like it might be pretty. Our pretty, of course, has got very pretty ears. Let's see if she comes around or just calls her cub out. Totally silent, completely silent in her approach. Here she comes. <laughs> So cool. It's not pretty. She's got stuff missing from her ears. It's Corky. It's our old pal Corky with the scars on the top of her head. And her corks. She will be calling out D1 and D2. Let's see if they come out. She's been lying in mud all day. I don't blame her. It is, of course, very hot today. Still quite warm. 
I wouldn't put the temperature at must much below 34 degrees Celsius. Now don't go away. Her little ones may be in the other side of the den, of course. Just off to the left-hand side of your screen, a dove is calling. Lovely call for the end of the day. She looks like she may have seen something. We'll try and move shortly. I just want to see what she's doing. See if she pops out the other side of the mound again. Maybe she'll just press on. I think what we should do is just move slightly. Oh, she's coming up back the other side, Brian. She's just over there. So while she's doing that, calling the cubs out, let me just move into a better position in case they do come out, which will give us a better view of her. I wonder if you're perhaps a new viewer. Curious Cookie, you want, you want to know if they have padded paws. Curious Cookie, uh, their paws pretty much exactly the same as your dog or your cat. So if you've ever felt a domestic cat or a domestic dog, they've got the same kind of paws. Probably hard like a dog's as opposed to soft like a little kitty cat's. But they've definitely got soft pads. come around the wrong side here. Uh, we'll forge ahead for now. There we go. She smelt something. She's looking both sides of the den. The other one is also now looking. in Pretoria, very good question. How far, you say, is the, was the dead artfark from this den? You say not too far, probably, simply because it took so long for any hyena to get there. It is, it is pretty far. It's probably about seven kilometers away. Mm, not quite that long. Uh, maybe four kilometers as the crow flies. And so, I mean, they would have picked up the smell, but what would normally happen is males who are not centered on this den, you know, they'll kind of forage quite widely, would have eventually found it. Now, I have had an experience with an elephant, not an elephant, a hyena on foot in that area, right around there, from probably this clan, where the hyena didn't really want to leave me alone. She was kind of watching me carefully, and so there definitely is a lot of hyena activity out there, and I know that the, the clan marking point, the kind, oh, look, 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 here we go. Here come the little ones. The midden site or boundary marker is along around there where that uh, where that uh, artifact was. Sorry, I was totally distracted by the little things coming out. Oh, and the little January cub. Ah, and all is right with the world once again. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you. 
See them greeting there. That's interesting. I think that's November greeting her at the moment. Yeah, it is. I'm not sure if we knew this or not, but November is very clearly a little male. We know that D1 is a male and D2 is a female. Oh, do we? I thought D1 was a female, but I just looked again and I'm not convinced that that's the case. Fascinating interactions here. And of course the other, the only other matriarchal society that we find out here. The little ones playing now. And they're all marking with their little anal glands. They're all marking territory, doing their bit for the clan. <laughs> and those, of course, are not Corky's youngsters. Now, Chief Keefe, you want to know how big this clan is. Chief Keefe, it's not actually that big. It's about 17 or so adults, as identified by the brilliant Juma slash Arethusa hyena group. And that's not particularly big. There's one of about 30 on Arethusa. But it is the most wonderful to watch how the social structure of this clan has unfolded over the last little while. We thought Corky was a matriarch for once, that's the one in front of you now, until we found them with what we now call Madam. That's, I think that's a little female. Yeah, that's, that's D1. We're pretty sure she's a female. The way you tell, if you're perhaps wondering, is you've got to have a look at the fully extended penis or pseudo penis, depending on which it is. And the males will have a pinched off end and the females not so much. So the easiest is to find an adult, basically, um, that you can compare. Now, I think there's one male and one female D cub. I think both the January cubs are male. And I think November might also be a male, but I might be completely wrong. is wonderful. Mm. So interestingly, that hyena there, the adult who's looking after the January ones, who was clearly left here as a nursemaid, is not a mother as far as I'm, can, I'm aware. Yes, that is madam. That can't be madam though, is it? I think it is. Yeah, her ears are that ripped. It is, madam. That's the matriarch. That's why she's looking after those little ones. She's the most tolerant of all of them. You can hear the little squealing noises they're making. So cool. And there'll be lots of snoozing going on because it is just so hot. Tomorrow is getting even hotter, everybody. So bring your sunscreen on drive tomorrow, in the morning as well as the afternoon. And then after that, we should have a bit of precipitation. Apparently. Apparently. Yeah, I think little November here, who we're we looking at, that's the bigger one, the bigger cub that you can see there. I think she's a he is a male. And that little January cub, as I look, actually could be a female. I don't know, I find it so difficult. I've only really started studying them since I came and started doing this job as a guide. You know, you'd spend kind of maybe 10, 20 minutes at a hyena den, and then you'd move on, and you didn't have the extended periods that we have with these animals like we do now. It's such a rare privilege 
to be able to just sit here and have a great time with them, study them, have such um, experience basically in the viewers who've seen so many hyenas who can give you advice, say, well, think about this, think about that, what do you think about that one? Oh, but you remember the sighting on um, the 4th of March two years ago. And it's wonderful. Debbie, you want to know if you can tell their sex from birth? Yes, if you can get a good look at the penis or pseudo penis, you can. But you really got to know what you're looking for. I mean, I'm still not sure that I'm correct about these, about these sexes, about the genders of all these little cubs. Obviously, from birth, you're not going to see them because they only stick their heads out of the den after about a week or two. A week, actually, they'll come out. And completely unlike a leopard cub, of course, which cannot defend itself inside a den. So while these cubs are pretty helpless, they will go into the den site and be virtually unreachable for a predator. Whereas a leopard cub, of course, doesn't dig as a youngster, and it's only really safe once it can start to climb a tree. And that's why we're perfectly happy to view these things from the day we can see them. But with a leopard, we're a lot more cautious. Time for the evening suckle. Hmm. You can see the light starting to fade. The sun has set. And as we watch the sun go down gently, let's head across to Jamie with some kudu. Unfortunately, par for the course this afternoon, my kudu seem to be disappearing into some very dense bush. I'm just going to try and get another view of them. All right, goodies. Disappearing into the drainage line. There's definitely more than nine stripes there, <laughs> just to continue on that subject. And she lifts up her tail, you can see the white flash. Disappearing off into the sunset. The light is extraordinary at this time of day. Okay. Let us continue on and see what else we can find. It's been one of those quiet afternoons, I think largely due to the heat as well. Most animals been, have been hiding out in the shade, resting and relaxing, and waiting for the cool of evening to fall. I'm gonna make my way back across to where we were looking for those lions for the last few moments of our or for the last sort of half an hour of our sunset safari and just see if they don't stir as it gets a bit cooler. If indeed they are still there and if we didn't miss their tracks crossing out somewhere else. I don't think so though. I have scoured that area with a fine tooth comb. I'm sure that they're lying down in the shade. Just right in the middle of that block as the Inkuhumas are often want to do. night starts to fall you get a whole different style of guiding it's right at that period just before we want to put our spotlight out but having the headlights on is a really useful way of catching tracks in the fading light definitely a thirsty day As 
as I gulp down water. Wayne was wondering what the temperature was today. It's not our hottest day that we've had out on drive, but it's pretty close. It was 38 degrees, which is 99 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on where you are from. Uh, definitely a very warm afternoon. Not quite warm enough for our cameras to sh start shutting down, but very, very close. As soon as we hit about 40 degrees, just over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, it is time for, it's when the, ca te the cameras start to give their temperature warning. Lovely male waterbuck. Actually seems quite dark in color. Now we can compare him to that fluffy little baby that we saw earlier. You can see what I mean about the difference in color. And those strange white rings around the rump. I'm going to try and see if I can find any local legends about explanation behind the waterbuck's white rump. He's wandering across to a female. There you go, you can see the size difference. Nice comparison. Oh, I'm going to stop and have a sif. Is he going to phlegm and grimace? Oh, he's going to phlegm and grimace face. There we go. Perfect. Thank you, boy. Being very cooperative. So that lifted lip and scrunched up nose, that face that he was pulling there, that is known as a phlegm and grimace. And what it does, he's going to go again. She's cooperating very nicely. I wonder if she's not coming into estrus. Nope. You also notice that he licks his nose and then pulls his tongue back into his mouth. All mammals, <laughs> she's not having any of it. She's gone now. Not interested. All mammals have what's known as the vomeronasal organ, or the organ of Jacobson, that sits at the roof of their mouth and essentially that tastes like smell. So you can imagine that they're tasting the smell and it's far more advanced. We have a residual one, but we've essentially lost the function of it because we no longer rely as heavily as we used to on our sense of smell. But that's why he was drawing his lips up. What it does is it opens up the passage to that organ of Jacobson and just allows it to act with its full efficiency. And you'll see all animals do it, except for elephants. And elephants, instead of doing that, what they'll do is they'll sniff with their trunk and then put their trunk into their mouths and touch the organ with their trunks. Because obviously they're not capable of pulling that particular face. Still, to me, the funniest animal is probably buffalo. I think they look hilarious when they do it. But all of the animals pull that hilarious face when they are sniffing and using that organ of Jacobson. And as we continue back to where I think the lions were, let's pop back over and jump on the back of James's vehicle. I would like you to all please do a count of the animals that you have seen today. You just had waterbuck, of course. You've had Nyala and Kudu with Jamie. We had buffalo to start with. We had zebra. We had an elephant. We had many elephants. We've had hyena. We've had impala. We've had, what have we not had? That's about all we've had. But I mean, what an incredible array of diverse animals that we've had during the course of a gentle afternoon. And we've hardly moved too far from home. I mean, we're only about two kilometers as the crow flies from where we live. I'm not sure where Jamie is. Now, this is classic madam behavior, completely tolerant of the others coming to say hello to her. Corky has not been seen being nearly this sort of tolerant of cubs that aren't her own. Now, Cindy in Tennessee, you're saying, would these cubs eat meat even though they are nursing already, or uh, well, still nursing? Cindy, yes, it's possible, um, especially madams, because she will bring food back to the den. She's a dominant female, and so it's highly unlikely that anyone would steal anything from her. Um, but certainly the rest of them will eat meat. If it comes, they will eat it, but they will suckle. Remember, hyena suckles for a long time. A hyena suckles for up to six months which is almost twice as long 
as any of the other predators. And I think sometimes some of them will start, try and suckle for up to a year. And they will be at the den for almost a year. So we still sometimes see June here. I don't see her here now. And it's quite interesting. It's one of the first times I've not seen her here when no one else has been around. She might be close by. June, of course, was born in June. So she'll be coming up on her 10, she'll be 10 months old soon. It's getting a little bit dark. So we, I mean, we'll stay with them for a little bit longer, but we're not gonna light them up. Now, Barbara, just in case there's any kind of misconception, you want to know how long it takes for them to build a den. Just in case there's a misconception here, they didn't build this den. So this is a termite mound, and I'm, I may be stating the obvious, and if I am, I'm sorry about that. But this is a, a termite mound that was built by termites, and then it would have been opened up by Art Fark, one of whom uh, we found yesterday, and fortunately in a state of uh, uh, putrid, put, putridity, or putridness, and it would have opened up one of those holes, and then the hyena cubs would have dug it, and they dig, actually, the mother would have ex excavated it to a certain extent, then she would have actually given birth into the den. And those youngsters come out with teeth and with claws and with their eyes open, unlike most of the other carnivores. And they would have immediately dug themselves a little shelf on which to lie. And that keeps them safe in the back from any other predator that might come along. And that happens very quickly. So they won't take it long at all to kind of excavate out a hole that an artifact has already opened up. You know, probably less than, less than an hour or two, I suppose. And they'll give birth there, and I'm sure the cubs are probably on top of their little shelves within sort of a few hours of being born. So although very vulnerable when they're young, they're not anything like as altricial as, say, the leopard or lion cubs are. And see how dark it's getting now. Eric Moore, you say you have heard that or read that hyenas suckle their cubs for so long because it takes that length of time for the immense jaw bones that they have uh, to develop in, to the extent that they're able to eat meat and bone. I think that's probably got something to do with it, Eric. Um, <clears throat> I suspect it's slightly more complicated than that. Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. There we go. Um, Eric, I think that you will find that it has something to do with the brain size and the complex nature of the social interactions that happen with hyenas. And so a bit like human beings, they suckle for slightly longer than they will, uh, than would other animals of similar mass. They have a very complex social structure which indicates a certain level of brain development that doesn't occur in many other animals. Then I think you'll find it's just a strategy that's worked, Eric. It's much easier for them to carry nutrients in the milk than it is to try and bring food back to the den. They don't regurgitate like wild dogs do, so it's not like they can carry meat back here without actually dragging a carcass. So what I think you'll find is that the safety of the den outweighs the disadvantage of having to bring m m food back here in the form of milk, and I think that's probably a more accurate reason for why they would be suckling for as long as they do. Um, I don't see why their jaws should become, or take any longer than a lion or a leopard's jaws to develop, especially as they're born so much more altricial, or precocial, sorry. Very quiet evening at the moment. Not much singing of birds, but just very peaceful. And the heat, thankfully, mercifully, starting to dissipate. Darlene in New Hampshire, uh, nice question, nice because I'm not sure that I can answer it. You say you've heard, read that the giggle or that kind of, well, there's something behind us, Brian. Just thought I heard a sound. 
I think it's just a bird. I think it's a redback shrike calling. Um, Darlene, you say that you've read that that giggling thing is a sign of submission and that only hyenas that are submissive will come and do it and what it results in is a kind of a relaxation of the dominance hierarchy and shows a, a dominant female that the subordinate acknowledges that sub, um, subordination. Um, it could well be. Yeah, Darlene, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've spent so little time actually studying hyenas before I came here. And now that I think of it, it only tends to happen when cubs or subordinates go around slightly more dominant ones. So, yeah, it could well be that that is the case. They do make a form of it, though, at a kill. When they're trying to gee each other up and steal some meat, they will make a sort of the form of that giggling sound. All right, everybody, we're going to leave these guys. It's starting to get a bit dark now. I know that every evening we have to leave them slightly earlier. But while we get out of here, let's head across to Jamie and find out what she's got as the night starts to fall. As night starts to fall, it's time to bring out the spotlight and use it to illuminate whatever animals happen to be wandering about in the darkness. There's always this incredible sense of excitement that I think most of us feel as night starts to fall. Part of that is an evolutionary instinct, a sort of a natural disquiet, the feeling that you should be indoors and safe. And that, of course, is because we're not adapted to be the nocturnal, a nocturnal predator or a nocturnal animal at all. But there's also the excitement of knowing that the bush is going to have all kinds of weird and wonderful things happen in the darkness. And there's always the chance of seeing some of the more unusual animals, something like a genet, for example, or a civet, one of the rarer nocturnal species, or a porcupine or an aardvark or any of those. What we're using the spotlight for is to bounce it off the layer at the back of the eye known as the tapetum lucidum. Now, a lot of people will tell you about how herbivores' eyes, so diurnal animals' eyes, reflect green back at you. My personal experience is that is not the case. It just depends on the angle that you hit the animal's eye at. And of course, with predator species, their eyes are forward spacing, whereas with prey species, their eyes are on the side to give them the widest possible peripheral vision. They can see threats approaching from either side of them. And that just means that the light hits them at slightly different angles. Also, the daytime animals, the diurnal animals, are not adapted for moving around at night. They generally try to stick in one spot as much as possible, doze on occasion. So you'll see impala herds regularly will be lying, half of them will be lying down, the rest of them will be standing, keeping a watch, keeping a watchful eye and ear and nose out for any sign of attack, whilst the, and then swap around so that they have a chance to rest. For animals out here, there's no real long sleep period. It's just a time to doze. We don't shine too much on the, on the diurnal species, so our daytime animals, because they're not adapted to deal with that level of light at night. It actually blinds them in the end. Not permanently, but it will take away their night vision. James Taylor is wanting to see, speaking of diurnal animals, he was one saying he hopes to see the wildebeest again soon. And it feels as though we don't see them much anymore. And that's actually a really good point. I was thinking that earlier today. I haven't seen that wildebeest herd in a long time. The last time I saw them, they were doing a mad dash onto Buffel's Hook away from the Inkahuma ladies. Maybe they've just decided to stay there for now. They might have discovered a nice grazing area. The calves are nice and big now, though they are capable of covering nice large distances. When we last saw them, they were already starting to get their horns. But just to finish off the topic of the spotlight and what we use it for, I always used to tell my guests to think of 
their eyes during the day like they would use a spotlight at night. Now when we shine it, we do it fairly rapidly because you kind of want to cover as much distance as possible because if I spend too long doing this, I'm going to miss whatever, whatever's on my right. You can try and check the open spaces as clearly as possible, up the big trees, checking for chameleons all the time, checking down roads. But the reason I say that they should use their eyes like that is very often if people are specifically looking for something in particular, let's say they only want to see a leopard, they will turn every bush and log, and I know I do it sometimes if I'm out looking for a particular animal, Every termite mound starts to look like a leopard. Every log looks like a leopard. And you end up stopping regularly. But you don't need to focus so hard. You actually need to let your brain relax into it, just like you are waiting for eyes to reflect back at you. Because your brain is geared to pick up on the shapes of animals. If you look, if you relax it and let sort of go back to your instinctive feeling, you're more likely to spot something particularly, of course, if it moves. And one of the things I always tried to teach my guests was not to over-focus on one thing. Oh, one animal I'm really aiming for, though it's still too hot, I would say, you never know, never say never. It is a drought and strange things happen in droughts. The one animal I'm aiming to get within the next few months is an art park. I still haven't seen one. Not even the dead one that James saw because I went back this morning and it was already fully consumed. So I would like to see a live one. I haven't even managed to see a dead one as James did yesterday. I would like to see a live art park. That is my goal for the next few months. And as it starts to get cooler, we're going to see more and more of them. They're already, I'm already noticing, okay, maybe not so much in the last two days, but I'm already noticing a huge difference in temperature in the mornings. There's a, a coolness to the air that bodes heavily for the beginning of winter. So Africa doesn't really have four seasons. We have two with a sort of a transition, short transition period in between. We've got hot and we've got cold and we've got dry and we've got wet, essentially. Looking for, as well for the little pearl spotted owlets that live on this road. today, a quiet afternoon, is actually really peaceful and relaxing to be out and just enjoy driving through the bush. You have to work hard for sightings, they can't always, you can't always just get lucky with them. And unfortunately the lions this afternoon didn't pay off, but tomorrow is another day and I'm sure they will, I'm hoping, fingers crossed, they're still going to be in the area. Maybe even coming down to Juma Pan for a drink or across to Gallego. We did find the rest, or at least one of the other guides, just by the way, speaking of the lions, did actually find the rest of the buffalo herd on Philemon's cut line. So not too far south of where we saw those lone females. when you see scattered buffalo like that you may automatically think that they may have been chased at some point by lions but Eric Eric who is watching in Dallas was wondering would a leopard be a threat to buffalo or are they too large and Eric there are a couple of recorded cases of leopards going for buffalo calves um, it's not that common we've seen how defensive buffalo can actually be when faced even with a predator as large as a lion. A leopard would have to choose its moment exceptionally carefully but it has been known to occur particularly when females go off on their own to give birth at which point they are 
exhausted and their calf is obviously still wobbly and vulnerable. So it is a possibility that once they get past a certain size and within a herd, they're most likely going to be safe from leopards. But bear in mind, of course, Eric, that some large male leopards have been recorded taking down prey as large as a young giraffe, which is easily the weight of a buffalo and much taller. Not a big buffalo, but a smallish buffalo. So in that respect, in nature, you never say never. I've even, I've even seen a cheetah have a go at a buffalo calf, but that was exceptionally unusual circumstances. James has left the hyena den, but apparently met up with another hyena, so let's go and have a look. Now this is a young hyena, I think, or a small male. Now we're actually exactly opposite where the kill was in the tree from, we think, Gajima. So a little while back, we almost a week ago now, we found a kill in a tree, well, Steph found it, uh, purely by nose, because it was starting to rot. And it seemed to have been abandoned. And it was right around here that we found a small hyena like this the next morning. And I wonder, what it's doing here now. It doesn't seem to be any meat around, but it might be worth just doing a little bit of a turn through here, just to see if there isn't something that it's waiting for. A hyena is one of the most patient animals you'll ever find. And if a lip has got a tree, Eventually, it becomes either so rotten that it falls out, or the leopard makes a mistake and drops a piece. That's why it was so unusual for me to see, or not to, or not to see, to hear that Karula had her cubs around where she had her last kill, because there were hyenas all over the place. It was rotting and smelling, and why she would have brought them into that kind of precariously dangerous position, I just can't imagine. Anyway, she knows best, I hope. I'm just gonna drive on to the cut line here. We're right on the northern boundary. Ken, you're tweeting to us and you want to know if a hyena might attack a human being. Ken, the kind of rule of thumb is if you're standing on your own two feet and it's in the middle of the day, a hyena won't come near you. If you're lying on your back at night and say you leave your tent open, then a hyena is likely to do quite a lot of damage. So, in fact, I mean, that's, that's when hyenas have killed people, is when they leave their tents open, they go camping in wildlife areas, hyenas come into their tents and take them out. So that does happen from time to time. But in the day, on foot, no, highly unlikely. I've seen many, many hyenas on foot. I've never been charged by one, but I have had an experience, I can mention the, just now, with a hyena that kind of stood behind the bush and watched me come, and I had to clap and make a noise before she'd move off. It's, it was in the tree that there was the kill. And we've just kind of done a 180 degree turn. Spotlight, you can see, is going to spot something about two and a half meters off the road. But I don't see any leopard's eyes, and I think that this, I think this kill was abandoned. So that's interesting that this hyena should still be here. Anyway, we're going to turn on and continue on our, the route that we were going to do, which was Mvubu Road. And Mvubu Road will lead us back to the Juma Dam. And we'll just check if some predator hasn't popped out to have a drink. Maybe those lions, those mysterious lions, have disappeared. I suspect quite strongly, given the amount of activity in the block where I thought those lions were, that they somehow crossed the road without us noticing. It's not unlikely, given the amount number of elephants that have been around. I mean, if that, that many elephants, you're not going to see a lion track. If the pride crosses in one line across the road, you're not going to see them. So I wonder if that isn't what happened. There's a little scrub here. I don't think he's been spotted because the spotlight isn't particularly bright. I think a scrub hair, rather like an impala, is an extremely underrated creature. It's obviously long hair-like ears. 
and nocturnal. It differentiates it from a rabbit. They make the most horrendous screaming noise of their court. And that, of course, is a response to, or it's an, a, an evolutionary adaptation to help them startle predators. And I suspect they get away from quite a lot of them because of the noise they make. So we're going to go just up the other side of this hill and down the other, and then we'll turn south again. Hoping perhaps to find sign of a leopard. Let's go across to Jamie while our signal is a bit dodgy and we'll see you at the dam. While you were with James, I was just thinking about other interesting aspects about spotlighting. And this afternoon, Liam and I decided we'd just pop up towards Bufflesook Dam and look for that shy male leopard that's been nicknamed Gijima by, I think it was initially um, started out by one of the Buffles Hook landowners, that particular name, because he Gijimas or he runs away from vehicles. But he has been seen at night, and interestingly enough, you'll find this with a lot of skittish leopards. They're a lot more confident when you sit and watch them with the spotlight. And I think it's got less to do probably with the spotlight than it has to do with the fact that they're just in general probably more comfortable at night. It's when they feel safest. They know that they've got superior nighttime vision. It is something interesting, and it was something that we experienced when I went to go and visit Brent's parents as well on a little reserve close to Hootsbreit. And they've also, the, res the leopards on that reserve are also fairly skittish during the day, but at night, you can sit and observe them almost, almost in the same way you can most of the Sabi Sands leopards. Maybe with a little bit more distance between you. It is fascinating that that is the approach that they have adopted. Go quickly. Don't jump, don't jump, don't jump, don't jump. You see him there, Bildi? Well done. Hello, little bush baby. Bobbing his head up and down to have a look at us. <laughs> so cute. They really are one of the cutest things. Where did he go? Oh, there he is into that tree. There he goes, bobbing up and down. Next jump. Oh, that was a big one. Oh, he's down there. There he is. He's coming closer. He's after that moth. Now he's on the ground. Now he's back up again, going after a moth. Oh, oh he's on the ground again. And he's up in the tree again. <laughs> there he goes. There he goes. There he goes. Oh, went into the marula tree. I'll have to switch on and try and keep an eye on him at the same time. Where's he going to go? He's going to cross the road. Oh. <laughs> that was awesome. There he is. Whee! That was a flying leap and onto the dead tree and now onto that tree, <laughs> keeping him very busy. Where did he go now? I lost him. Oh no! Let's go forward a little bit. That was very cool. Oh, I think I might have lost him when he jumped down from here. Whoops, better watch the road. Where did he go? Let me just switch off for a second. I think I missed him. I think he moved off the tree, just out of my field of view and to the back there. But bravo to Viam for managing to keep up with that. That was incredible. <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, if it was your first time, that was a lesser galago or a bush baby. That was actually so cool. 
So the smallest little primate, called bush babies because their cry actually sounds like a baby, more so with a greater galago than with the lesser galago. We had one in camp the other day, and I think we've, both James and myself have mentioned this, but it fell out of a tree onto the ground and then slowly crawled its way back up. But VM was just telling me the most interesting story. Apparently he saw a monkey actually catch a lesser bush baby, which I have never seen. That is a really unusual sighting, but awesome stuff to hear. Now, when I was staying in up in Pafuri over my birthday weekend when I was on leave, we actually had sort of sleeping up on a tent plat on top of a platform, so almost like a tree house. And at about four o'clock in the morning, it's been a long time since I've heard a greater galago or a greater bush baby call. And this thing screeched next to my ear. I promise you, I nearly levitated out of bed and to the opposite wall. It sounds just like a baby, which in sort of the middle of nowhere, in the middle of a tent, is the last thing that you expect. It goes, Wah! It's an awful sound, actually. But yes, that was, the, that was the larger cousin of the bush baby that we just saw. That was very cool. Chasing moths. Oh, I thought I'd found it again, but it's a night jar. Also one of the nocturnal species that we see fairly regularly. I'm gonna stop so you can have a look at him. I'm thinking it's a fiery necked night jar. They are very tricky to tell the difference between, particularly when they're crunched up like that, sitting on the road. The reason that they love sitting on road areas is that it's nice and open and it's nice and warm, so it attracts insects at night. And they are perfection or perfectly designed insect catchers. They've got an enormous, what's known as a gape, so the extent that they can open their mouths, yeah, that looks like a fiery neck night jar. Do you see the sort of the fiery neck at the back there? Wonderful little birds. Off he goes. I was about to, I was about to say to you that I'm gonna turn my lights off him and let him head off. Before I start the engine, I'm actually going to say farewell to you for this evening's drive. A big thank you as always to Viam for his fantastic camera work and a really big well done for managing to stay with that bush baby. As well as a big thank you to Mr. Henry and Brian for providing you with the wonderful images that you've enjoyed this evening. And as always, a thank you to you, the viewers, for jumping on the back of the largest safari vehicle on Earth. We will see you tomorrow morning for the Sunrise Safari, hopefully with those lions, because I'm feeling fairly determined at this point. I hope you have a wonderful day wherever you are in the world, and we'll catch you tomorrow morning. Cheers for now. We're just doing one final sort of foray onto quarantine clearings. See if anything has popped out there. Maybe those lions are going to pop down. If you are around the Juma Dam pan, well, obviously none of you are actually around it, but if you're going to watch it or leave it on in the corner of your screen during the, your screen during the course of our evening, I think you might be lucky with those lions. I think it's been a hot day. I think they've had nothing to eat. Well, they may have eaten. I'm not sure, but I think they're going to seek out water during the course of the night. So keep watching there. I think you might be lucky. Lots and lots of impala out on the clearings. They've all materialized out of the thickets, trying desperately to see if anything's going to come bite them during the course of the night. Not much for them to eat. They would ordinarily want to be on a grassy clearing Ooh, that offers them something to eat. Some of these younger impala are a bit... Um, but nervy around the lights. The older ones don't mind much. There are hundreds of them here, hundreds. We can't shine on them, on them, of course, but you'll get a vague idea. They've got the dim sort of floodlight on them. I'll lift it up a bit. There you go. <laughs> that, was, that was really helpful, wasn't it, Brian? Yeah. yeah it was really showing as a lighting expert. Brilliant. It's so nice to be a genius, Brian. 
All right, we're going to stop over here. Look, Brian, I'm taking your advice, stopping behind this bush here. Perfect. Now, thank you, everybody, for your questions and comments. I had the most wonderful time with those elephants, a little bit with the hyenas, but best elephant sighting I think I've had. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Kirsten and Geraldine Cheesecake Kent in the final control. A big thank you also to Jamie and Viam. We will see you all tomorrow at 0530 in the glory of the African dawn. Bye-bye.